And welcome to this edition of the Selling Through Partnering Skills podcast, where I'm joined by James Muir, the author of The Perfect Close, the best selling book, The Perfect Close. Sorry, James, I've got a rubbish memory. Um, so, so, James, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here, Fred. And could you just give us a tiny uh, introduction about yourself, other than being the best selling author of The Perfect Close? <laughs> Sure. Well, I'm the I'm the founder and CEO of Best Practice International. I've been in sales and selling for over 30 years. I've served in every role from individual contributor all the way up to executive VP. I've managed uh, sales forces of over 100. So, uh, and now I spend a lot of my time just trying to help other folks. Uh, my favorite thing is uh, I try my best to take complex things, make them simple, and I'd like to turn the light bulb on for people. So that's the, the part of my life that I get the most satisfaction out of. I, I did hear about making complex things simple, which was massively attractive to me personally. Um, and yeah, look, I'm, I'm always looking for new ideas. But I've got you in here on a little bit of a naughty pretext in that I want to challenge you a little bit, if that's okay. Sure. Well, <laughs> Open the fire. Perf the, what the perfect close? Isn't that a little bit 80s? Oh my gosh, I have I've taken so much guff for naming it the perfect close. And I didn't even, I didn't even name it. Line. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even name it. I uh, I had a student that said, "Oh, this is perfect. It's perfect, right?" And I was going to call it something approach or something like that, but that sounded a little weird to me, so I just went with it. Um, but you know, most people misjudge the title. They think because of the title that is some kind of manipulative trick or tactic from the 70s or the 80s that, you know, if you say this thing it magically persuades people into buying your stuff. And it's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. It is, uh, it's just two questions. It's um, completely facilitative. It's completely non-confrontational and it's 95% effective. So it's very effective. In fact, it's been tested. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. There is a company out there called gong.io and what these guys do is they specialize in call analytics, right? They analyze calls in these big call centers, these outbound call centers. And they ask this question, they say, what is the best closing approach? And they analyze over a million calls and what they determine is the perfect close, which was the one I hope we'll, we'll share with your audience here in a minute, is hands down the best closing approach that there is and that the, the top performers are actually using it about three times an hour. And which should tell you that it doesn't get old the more that you use it. So there's a little bit of uh, scientific uh, backup for it. Well, Carry on. It, look, it doesn't need me to ask the question. <laughs> what are What's, these magic? What are these? What are the two questions? questions? All right, all right. Well, oh, sure. on, so, please. so maybe before we tell them what the questions are, oh. we should we should think about this for a second. We should think it's important before you go into any sales interaction. Hey, what do you want to get out of this? What are you hoping is going to happen as a result? Right. Just spend just a minute thinking about what you would like to happen, and uh, what you want to have is you want to have an ideal advance. Okay, and, and a couple of backup or alternative advances. Now, in case your audience isn't familiar with the term in advance, a wonderful person that I would call him the patron saint of scientific selling named Neil Rackham, he's from the UK. And uh, he wrote a book uh, called Spin Selling. And, but he also conducted uh, the largest face-to-face -face sales study ever conducted. It involved over 35,000 face-to-face sales interactions. And we learned a ton of things, ton of things about selling from his research. And what he learned, one of the things he learned uh, is that nine out of 10 sales interactions actually don't end with a win or a lose. That, that's not what actually happens. What happens in nine out of 10 sales interactions is we either get what he called an advance where the sale moves forward in a little way, right? We get a little progress. Okay. Or he, we get what's called a continuation. And a continuation is a situation where the sale continues, but really no progress is made. It's just sitting there, right? Stuck in your pipeline doing nothing. Okay. And so that's what happens in nine out of 10 sales interactions is we either get an advance or continuation, right? So um, the reason I'm sharing this thing with the advance is we want to think what's the ideal advance, what's the best possible outcome we could hope for. And then we want a couple of backups just in case our ideal advance proves unrealistic for some reason. Okay, that's it. And if you've got that ready, right, then you are prepared for the two magic questions. Okay, and and they're very unassuming. So when you you write these down, you go like, and, and literally, there's people have, have called me after listening to the show or sent me an email. Go, Holy smokes, this worked! I tried it literally right after I got off the show, and it worked. Okay, so the first question is some variation of, does it make sense for us to X? Okay. So let's just say I'm a consultant friend and we do assessments or something like that. And I say, hey, does it make sense for us to schedule an assessment for you to see what our best options are? Okay. In that example, the assessment is the X. Okay. Now, if you think about it, there's only two things they can say. They're going to say yes 
They're going to say no. If they say yes, awesome. You just got your ideal advance and you only had to ask one question. You didn't have to use the other question. Okay. If yeah. they say no, and, and maybe before I tell you what the second question is, there's actually five variations of the perfect close. Okay. And what we're teaching your audience right now is the kindergarten version. And so in the kindergarten version, if they say no to the first question, you're just going to throw the ball back to them and you're going to ask some variation of, okay, well, um, what do you think is a good next step then? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what I can tell you after I've done hundreds and hundreds of ride alongs is that in 90% of cases, if you ask that question, the client will offer you a very logical next step for them for where they're at in their buying process. Okay. And so what that means is you either get an advance because they answered your first question or the customer advances it in a way maybe you didn't expect. Okay. And so those two things together, you either get an advance or a close pretty much every time you use it. Now, we can upgrade it a little bit, right? I mean, I, I get guff all the time for having called it the perfect close. They say, hey, James, 90% is pretty good, but it's not perfect, right? And so <laughs> give them 90%, they want 100%, right? And so- um, uh, Expectations, customer expectations, yeah, mate. <laughs> geez, right? And so um, the, uh, th there is a way to upgrade this just a little bit, okay? And so the first upgrade or variation is called the suggestion. And that's where you're going to use these other all, these all other advances that you've prepared. And I would say it's especially helpful if you're selling something that's very complex. Like uh, I spent most of my life in the healthcare IT industry, and mm -hmm. you know people buy these big monolithic healthcare IT systems maybe once in a lifetime. So if they, if I said, hey, what do you think is a good next step? Sometimes they will not know a good next step because they've never done this before. Right? So they could use a little help from me to tell them what a next step is. So the suggestion model is really just the same thing as the basic one, except for at the beginning, we'd say, you know, other clients at this stage tend to do X. Does it make sense for us to do X? Okay, that's it. All we're doing is making a suggestion. Right. And as it turns out, you can use it in the second question. So let's just say I say, hey, you know, does it make sense for us to schedule an assessment? And for some reason you say no, right? You're not comfortable or whatever. Then I could say, well, you know, other clients at this stage will sometimes do this other thing. Does it make sense for us to do that? And that's using it in the secondary question. And we call that variation the fallback. So you're falling back to one of the other two alternatives that you prepared in advance so that every time you meet, we're always getting some kind of progress. Okay. Now there's another variation that's much more fun. Oh, by the way, at the end of the, at the end of the, the, the fallback, you let's just say you, you say no to the second thing too. Then you would just throw the ball back to them and say, okay, well, what do you think is a good next step then? Okay. Um, uh, there's another one called the add-on and it's even better. Okay, and that what they is if, if we said, hey, does it make sense for us to schedule an assessment? You say, sure. I go, well, you know, sometimes clients at this stage also do this other thing. Does it make sense for us to do that too? And so what we're doing is we're adding them on, right? And and you can there so doesn't seem to be a diminishing point of add-ons. You can keep going until you've reached the pace the customer's ready to go. But at the end of the add-on, the final question you ask is this: You say, well, are there any other logical steps we should be thinking about right now? Okay. And what that does is it gives the customer a chance to suggest some logical steps that maybe they thought of, but you didn't think of. Okay. And I'll, I'll tell you a crazy story about this. I'm working with a, a healthcare organization in uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona. We actually thought we were presenting to the wrong people. Okay. So we thought we had the wrong audience. So our ideal advance was to do a presentation for the executive management team because we thought that's who was going to end up making the decision. So, you know, we do our demonstration. We, we talk to this guy and I look at my list. I say, hey, well, you know, does it make sense for us to schedule a time um, to show your executive team so we can get their participation input? He goes, yes, that's a great idea. We need everybody on, bo on board. I'm like, wow, cha-ching. All right. I got, I got my first advance. So I just look at my list. I go, you know, um, a lot of clients at this stage will want to schedule a time for our technical people to talk about the conversion. Does it make sense for us to schedule a time for our tech people to meet? He's like, yes, my guys are super worried about that, right? And I'm like, wow, cha-ching, right? I got two for two. And so hmm. I look at my list, right? I, I, and, I, and so I say, well, you know, I think I've got everything I need here to create like a preliminary proposal for you just so we can, you can get a feel for what the scope is. Does it make sense for me to put together a preliminary proposal for us? He goes, yes, that would be very helpful. I'm like, wow, I'm three for three, right? So I ask him that last question. I say, well, all right, are there any other logical you know, things we should be thinking about right now? <laughs> You'll not believe what this guy says, right? He kind of looks around and he kind of lows his voice a little bit and he says, well, is there any chance I could get a copy of your standard agreement? Because our legal people can be kind of slow. <laughs> right? And so I know what you're thinking, right? Like on the outside, I'm cool as a cucumber, right? I'm like, oh yes, of course, I'd be totally happy to get you a copy. But on the inside, I'm like, yeah, baby, of course I could get you a contract, right? And the, the thing is, is I would have never dreamed in a, 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 ever that there was a, a chance that we could have walked out of that meeting talking about contracts, okay? Because we didn't even think we were presenting to the right people. 
But by diplomatically pacing it at the rate that this guy was ready to go, we scored an amazing four advances, one of which we hadn't even dreamed of. And that's really the beauty of this approach is that if the customer wants to go slower, then we're going to use that fallback to go a little slower. If we, if the customer wants to go faster, we're going to use that add-on to go a little faster. And the key here is that we're pacing it at the rate that the client is ready to go. It's when we try to push them faster than they're ready to go, that's when it starts to feel like manipulation to them. But if we do it this way, right. you can see it's just completely, all you're doing is facilitating. That's all you're really doing, right? And so it's totally non-confrontational. I love it. Absolutely love it. The elegance is the simplicity, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But and the point you're making there is the pacing and it, but it's not just asking the question. There's a lot more behind it, isn't it? And an expertise in sales to know when to ask it and to know what the add-on might be. So if there's any, if there's any prep work, it's in the figuring out in advance, yeah. what do you think is the best and the yeah. follow-ups, right? And honest guys, that doesn't take that long. I would okay. recommend if you're managing a team of people, like let's say you get one of your clients, I would just get them together. And then as a group, we say, all right, what are all the little steps on our way to the big step? Mm -hmm. And we do, mm -hmm. we'll write them all down. We'll get them on a list. And then before you prepare your call, you won't have to think from scratch. You'll just go look at your menu of, of possible advances that are common for your kind of sale. And you say, okay, I'm going to, I think this is the best option for this meeting. But in case I don't get that, I'm going to choose either this one or this one. And you have those prepped. And then I would recommend, you don't have to do this, but I would recommend, even if you have a very simple sale that only takes, you know, 15, 20 minutes, I still bring in an agenda, a piece of paper, even if it's only on half sheet of paper. And, um, and then what you want somewhere near the bottom of that is action items and next steps. Okay. And so as you walk through this, you're going to ultimately end up at this part that says action items and next steps. And that's when you're going to ask your perfect close question using one of the advances that you planned. And so honestly, you don't have to be psychic. You don't have to, oh, is this the right moment to use the alternate choice close? Or is this the, right? Yeah, is this well, the uh, right moment to use the, you know, sharp angle close? Or you know, there's all these dysfunctional closes. Ben Franklin, there. the Ben Franklin. Yeah, Come yeah, on, exactly. let's get the paper like, out. Oh, and, I can't. I'm locked away in my studio. You're in yours. <laughs> when I first got into sales, I was like, oh, Lord, the pressure. I don't know which clothes I should be using. And I don't know exactly the right time to use it. But the thing is, it's not that complicated. It's not that complicated. Just, you're basically going to use these two questions and you're going to put it in your little agenda, next act item, next steps. And you're just going to walk through it. And when you get to there, here's the, uh, the nuance, Fred, that people miss. When you first teach it to people, what they're worried about is if they say no to the first question. That's what they're worried about. Okay. But here's the thing. If they say no to your first question, what have they said no to? Did they say, no, I'm not going to buy your stuff? No, because we didn't ask them to buy anything. Did they say, no, I'm not going to do what you're asking? No, because we haven't asked them to do anything. We've only asked them if it made sense. So at its core, does it make sense is a timing question. It's not an actual question for an action. And that leaves you, regardless of how they answer, emotionally on much, much higher ground, okay? It doesn't matter how they answer, because what we're really saying is, is the timing right for us to do this? In fact, if you like that phrase better, by all means, use it. You know, is the timing right for us to do this? And the thing is, you can never get the timing wrong because the question itself is essentially a timing question, <laughs> right? So you don't yeah. have to sweat about when's the right, oh, I'm reading the sweat coming off this guy's brow. And so now must be the right moment to ask the, the closing question. You don't have to do that. because Pupils are dilated. Oh, they must be yeah, interested. Yeah, yeah zoom just, in on the camera, yeah. <laughs> people make it way too complicated. They make it way too complicated, right? So just you know, know it's been tested and that this very simple facilitative way is the single most effective way you can actually advance the sale. And it won't, if you want to, did you, you made this surprise, this might surprise you, 50 to 90% of all sales Sales actually end without um, sales meetings and without any commitment being asked for. 50 to 90 percent. Like, like, that's like a mind-blowing statistic to me. And mm -hmm. if you say, hey, James, why do you think that is? What I would tell you is that all of these closes that we we're talking about all, that all have names, right, is they're all dysfunctional and they are all manipulative. And since the client doesn't want to damage the relationship, right, or the trust that they already have with the client, instead of using one of these tactics that they know is going to damage trust, they just don't do anything. Okay, so now you've learned a way to do it that's not going to damage trust, that's facilitative and leave you on emotionally higher ground. There'll be no reason for you not to ask because the, that, that's why you're there. They're trying to get something done and they're hoping you're going to help facilitate that. So you're like a coach in that regard. Exactly right. Yeah, the, I, I suspect that that high number is because people haven't got that intent. They've not got that purpose. They don't know what they're doing or it's to go and make friends. So actually they have left with friends. So they've kind of achieved their objective. It's not really an advancement, is it? <laughs> um, and of course, not, not using an agenda. I mean, don't start me. That's, that's a bit of a soapbox over here for me. So uh, <laughs> of course you said one. And in virtual sales land, even more so, I would say it's an important thing. But 
that's a different podcast. <laughs> what what I love with what you're doing here is the facilitative element of it because we talk to people about that and they go, what do you mean? So, well, you've got to kind of guide the customer or you've got to lead them. And this frightens people that they, they get this image in the head of going, well, I'm going to go in and tell them what to do. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> you're going to ask them a question <laughs> with a bit of an idea. That if they don't know the answer, you say, well, we could do this kind of, I mean, I, I know I need to practice my language patterns better to fit in with what you've written, but it's just such a, elegantly easy way to a simple way to, to do that it's sublime actually in my opinion right it's a very simple concept and you can get a lot of mileage out of it. in fact i've had brand new sales reps that don't even know what a logical next step is so let's just say you're in that boat like literally you just got hired yesterday you're in a brand new kind of sale. you have no idea you a, a trick that you could do we'll call it a hack is don't <laughs> don't don't even use the first question don't even use the first question just use the second question you could say, so you would just say, hey, um, what do you think is a good next step? And what will happen if you're totally ignorant, you know nothing about this kind of sale, is the customer will suggest the next step for you. And as long as you just keep helping them make their own next steps, you'll be facilitating the sale. You'll be getting advances every time you meet. And the, the thing that sometimes people push back against is they want to close it in their time frame. And what I would tell yeah, you is yeah. you're making a big mistake if you're trying to move the customer faster than they're ready for. So all you're yeah. trying to do is facilitate that. And if you want, I can give you like a, let's just imagine that you're sort of in a, a much more complex cell that has a lot of smaller decisions in it before they get to the big decision. Here's an a way that you can facilitate what they want. You can just say, tell me a little bit about the process that you guys are going to go through as you guys do your evaluation. What are you guys going to do? Right. And they're going to tell you a bunch of things and you just write these all down. If you see that they're missing something, like maybe they forgot to, to check references is one of the steps and you think that's going to help you, right? Or whatever. You're, you could say, hey, you know, other clients sometimes will want to check references before they get to the contracting stage. Is that something that you guys want to do? Yes. Great. You just inserted some of your own criteria into their steps. But now what you have is you have this nice list of maybe half a dozen or a dozen things that they're going to do as they go through their process. And now you're just going to help facilitate them take the next thing on the list, right? And so what you're doing is you're honoring their buying process, but like a coach, like a consultant, like a facilitator, you're helping them get to the next step so they're getting to their goal faster. And guys, that's why they're talking to us. If they could do it on their own, they wouldn't talk to you, right? They're try they need your help to get to the goal. <laughs> and so by them telling you that, now all you've done is you've become a consultant and a facilitator, and that will ele elevate your role with the customer to that of a trusted advisor rather than a agent that's trying to push software or pro trying to push product onto them. That sounds like the sort of thing a good partner would do, but I would say that because <laughs> um, no, it, it absolutely fits in with the ethos that I try to help salespeople with, which is to use the partnering skills PQ to move people to help them to understand. The, the, the question I've got for you to hear, though, is and you're working to train salespeople to do this more effectively. How do you find in the first instance when they just get their heads around it that they feel when they're asking the customer what the next step is? Because what I'm thinking is a lot of salespeople go, oh, no, I can't do that. My job's to tell them. I'm a salesperson. I give them this information. I point them. I tell them. I do all that sort of stuff. It, is that hard work in the early days until they sort of finally kind of get the, the aha moment, if you like? It is better for you to understand what they're trying to do better than the client does. Okay. Now, odds are pretty good, though, especially if you're in any kind of a complex sale, that you do know. Because they might buy one of these things once or twice or yeah, even 10 times in a, in a lifetime. But you're doing it every day. So odds of you understanding a good logical next step is actually probably more likely for you. You can add a lot of value by helping them through the logical steps, right? So I would say uh, don't uh, don't shy back from sharing your your personal experience because you can add a lot of value to the the sales experience for them by recommending logical steps for them. Um, but I would say this at the uh, you know. Just because, so, so the conundrum is this, right? I'm a manager. I just hired a sales guy. Does that mean my sales guy has to become a genius at everything we do before he can become an effective closer? And I would say the answer is really no. You, it's not. It's better to, for you to suggest steps and then fall back than it is for you to just ask the customer, what do you think is a good next step then? But I'll tell you what, you can get 70, 80% effectiveness by just asking them what they think is a good next step. Then if they can tell that you're just trying to help, they will they will suggest steps that make sense to them. They don't always get it right. They don't always get the perfect step, but you're going to still be making progress. And maybe the rule here is that customers are always comfortable with their own next steps, right? They're never going to push back on the thing they suggested. And so even if it's not maybe the choice you would have 
picked, right? They're gonna, it's gonna be one that's logical to them. And so facilitate that step. And then you can say, well, what do you think is a good next step? That, I would say that's a good place to start, but really over time, as you gain more experience, you wanna be much, a little bit more prescriptive about what, okay. you know, maybe the best next step is. Okay, but it, it, it certainly makes it more accessible for people because rather than be a genius who understands every single thing, with which I think there's a danger because then you feel impelled to tell everybody every single thing, <laughs> which is often irrelevant. It's, right. well, no, you only need to know the next step. Just make a little suggestion. Let them do the talking. So actually you get speed to competence or, or people doing stuff more effective faster. So it sounds like it's something really you nailed it. to me. When you said, yeah, when you, well, when you <laughs> say sold. speed to competence, what happens is imagine you just got hired yesterday. You really don't know a good logical next step. The customers will be teaching it to you as you ask them for next steps. And so you'll eventually understand all the little steps that are common to your type of sale. So it'll, it'll literally teach you how and it'll you'll, you're onboarding. The, the thing that, that I think a lot of people make a mistake on is they spend a lot of time analyzing and over-preparing when really to put yourself in the crucible is actually the fastest way to learn because there's a whole bunch of biological things that happen. What happens is your adrenaline goes up, right? You're like, oh no, what's going to happen here? And that actually improves your memory retention, regardless of the outcome, right? If a good thing happens, you're like, wow, I did it. And so that adrenaline reinforces the behavior. On the other hand, let's just say you crash and burn for some reason, right? Well, you learn really fast. Hey, don't do it like that. All right. That doesn't work. And so either way, the fastest way is to get into the crucible and actually do stuff, not not analyze endlessly before you jump into it. And that's hard for me to say to you because I am an overanalyzer, right? I, 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 am that, I am that person that has the problem jumping in with two feet. I've written down, don't do any more prep, Fred. <laughs> no, I haven't, don't worry. It, it, it takes thought and prep and planning what you're going to do, but it's not that level of detail that, oh, I need to read the catalog backwards, forwards and upside down to be able to answer every single thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's over preparing. You don't, yeah. you, you need to know just enough, basically. Yeah. And if their next step is, oh, I think we need to know more technically. Well, I'll go and get a technical guy then. Okay, fine. Let's set up a meeting to do that. There you go. So, no, this, is, this is so cool. So, what I actually did write down was <laughs> adrenaline improves memory. Yeah. I've not come across that before. I've come across a lot of things that adrenaline does to us, but I didn't know this memory thing. Yeah. How so, does, I, what's that? How, what's that about? <laughs> well, uh, there's a whole bunch of other things besides adrenaline, but basically, uh -huh. when you put yourself in a situation, you get into this hyper awareness stage, okay. right? And it's if you think about it from a, we'll just say, evolutionary perspective, when you're in a, when a dangerous situation, you're in an important learning moment, right? Whether it's you're <laughs> running from the saber toothed tiger or whether you're having a, a meeting with someone, and so. What basically physiologically you're in the best and most ideal place to be learning at that moment because whatever happens, your body will will respond to it and it creates a lasting. So even if you make a mistake, the the mistake is remembered longer. If you do it positively, then of course a bunch of other it's another hormone called endorphins are given off, and and then that actually rewards the behavior and you're and that of course makes you want to re, reinforces it. You want to do it again. Right. So the key is if you don't give yourself any kind of stimulus, you don't get either of those. Right. And right. so just yeah. analyzing. Right. And I would also argue that when we can, when we can, we're better off being face to face than remote. Right. Because it's it's less jeopardy to be remote. Right. Or even worse, just email. Maybe they never see my face at all. And I'm just trying to do everything with, with email. It's 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 less effective, guys. It, it doesn't mean you can't be successful with it. You can. But it's good, better, best. Right. And so good, maybe email better is maybe a face, you know, is a, a webinar or something like this where we're talking and the best is face to face because it's the most human to human interaction that you can get. Agreed. But I'm also going to slightly disagree and genuinely this time rather than the first time around was for a lot of people, I think the adrenaline is coursing through the veins when they're doing stuff on video at the moment. It, it, it's still quite a challenge for a lot of people. So they're probably getting that that effect what i'm trying to do is encourage people to do this stuff on video as well because you'll get you, you'll learn you'll learn better um but yeah i, yeah. I get what you say when, when the only get, answer is to do it like though we've got to do it yeah that's what we're saying <laughs> that's the only answer and that you know what Step i would say is the keyboard <laughs> well, one thing that i think sales people do is that we make it way too complicated right we're thinking about it too hard and what's happening is they're leaning into it they're thinking about what am i going to get out of this how do i make this do what i want and all that kind of stuff and here's the here's the truth guys is um is you send a bunch of non-verbal communication to a customer anytime you're you're with them 
Okay. And I'll just briefly go over them really quickly. There's something called mirror neurons that mm -hmm, causes mm -hmm. you to sympathize with another person. It's magic. And it's what causes you when you go to a movie and you see the protagonist do something that's sad and you feel sad. Those are mirror neurons, neurons triggering. Okay. Um, second, Sorry, I'm laughing because if anybody cries on television or in a film, my wife starts crying. <laughs> so she's got a high race, right? She's, she's packed full of them. <laughs> yeah. So the second is there's something called micro uh, expressions. Uh -huh. And the wonderful show, by the way, if you want to learn about them and be entertained at the same time, there's a movie, uh, a TV show from, I think, 2012 or something like called Lie to Me. And, yeah. um, and in Lie to Me, the, the premise is that the uh, – uh, and by the way, the, the, the main character in that show is actually built after a real guy. The real guy's last name is Ekman. He's the scientist that actually understood all that. But uh, Dr. Lightman is the guy in the show that's actually playing the character. And what they do is they're like human lie detectors. They can see these these one twenty fifth of a second, you know, non. And but what they'll do in the show is they'll actually slow down video, and you can see these micro expressions in real life, so you can you can understand the principle. But um, what I'm trying to share with you here is that. For, for the rest of us where we don't have entertainment to help us slow down the video is people can't pick up on it um, consciously. They, they more describe it as a feeling, but what's really happening is they see micro expressions in your face and that causes them to feel uneasy about you or they, it causes them, cause you to, uh, them to feel different ways about you. Okay. And the last is called is paralanguage and paralanguage is the tonality and the prosody in your voice. And you do have a little more control over that. But for example, if you ask your significant other, how you're doing and they say, fine, <laughs> You can tell by the way they said fine that they're definitely not fine, right? Well, so all of these things are happening at the same time while you're talking to the customer, okay? And they're picking up on this in the first very, literally very few first few seconds of when you meet. And um, and so when you first tell salespeople about all these nonverbal messages that they're um, that they're sending out, is they're worried. They say, well, how do I control it, James? How do I control it? And the answer is, you can't. You can't control it. Yeah. The yeah. only thing, the only way, and, and maybe we should put some little science behind this, is when for, people meet you in the first two seconds, they determine warmth and competence. These two things are the main things that they look at. And warmth is like your intention. They, they're like, say, hey, is Fred trying to help me or is he trying to hurt me? Okay. And then once they've judged whether or not Fred's intentions are good or bad, then they say, is this person actually capable of doing what they intend, right? Could he, can he actually hurt me or not, right? And so um, those two things, and the mistake that most salespeople make is they play very heavily into competence, okay? They think if I prove that my solution is the best, I will win. And the, answer, and the truth is, guys, that is not the case. What all the social science shows is that um, judgments of, uh, of warmth and intent are primary, meaning they happen first, and they carry more weight than competency does. So if you fail the intent part of the formula, the warmth part of the formula, it really won't matter how competent you are at solving the problem. There's probably some exceptions to that. Like you might you might pick a jerk as a brain surgeon because you really got to have it. But if, when people have options, the, your intentions are important. And what happens is if they judge your intentions are off, then they start withholding information. They, they stop giving you information. And now you can't make a great diagnosis and how are you supposed to prescribe a great solution if the customer hasn't even given you the right you know the right signs and symptoms of their problem right and so now the whole selling process is dysfunctional so back to our original question guy just get off yourself for a minute go in there blank slate and say how can i help this person and guys it might include you but it might not okay and so you just go in there blank slate with and if you get your intent in that place first of all you won't be leaning into it so hard Right. And you won't be sweating about being on video or what they think of or all this kind of stuff because all you're trying to do is help. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you will magically be sending all of the appropriate signals that cause them to trust you. And what I can tell you is it will flip exactly the other way. Let's just say you get something wrong. Maybe you blew something in their proposal, whatever like that. People will come back to you because they can tell you're trying to help and they'll give you second, third, fourth times to uh, swing at the plate because they can see that you're actually genuinely trying to help them. It's when, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had, a, I had a customer call me one time and said, well, about one of my sales guys. He says, don't ever send that guy back here again. That guy has commission breadth, okay? That, <laughs> in, the, in a word, that captures exactly what we're trying to, what we're just talking about here. You, we don't wanna be sending the wrong signal. What my sales guy was doing is sending a message. I don't give a crap about you. I just care about getting your money. Right. And that's why my, this guy called me. So don't ever send that guy back here. Right. So you're trying to avoid that. You want to do exactly the opposite. Let them understand you're really just genuinely trying to help. And guys, from a selling perspective, it is so much more relaxing to walk in, not have to worry about the outcome 
and just thinking how you can help. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you another crazy story, right? I was just uh, working on this. Uh, I'm writing a book right now on referrals, okay? And uh, so this, um, I'm working with a, a clinic and uh, this lady at the clinic had us come out and show us the software and then it's overkill. It's overkill. We, it, it, we, we were not the right choice for her. So I recommended two competitors for her, okay? Mm. And uh, I never thought I'd see her again. Two years later, I get called by Glenn Edwards out at Banner Health Systems, which is one of the largest health systems in the Western United States, huge. And our first deal with this guy was about $5 million. And then over the next few years, he bought another $5 million worth of stuff. So this, this deal was worth about 10 million bucks. So one day I am talking to Glenn Edwards. I say, you know, what made you call us to begin with, right? And you'll never believe it. It was this woman at this clinic that I had recommended two competitors to, but didn't sell anything to, was the one that had recommended he call us, okay? And so the point of this story is that you do the right thing, not because I'm expecting reciprocity to somehow take over and two years later, I'm gonna get a $10 million deal. You do it because it's the right thing to do, guys. That's why you do it. And then what will happen, call it karma, call it whatever you want, reciprocity is the, me the mechanism at play here, but you don't count on it, don't expect it. Just do the right thing because it's the right thing and it will work out for you very different it's like don't give a spreadsheet with it oh, i gave them that so that's going to come back into me don't dates and everything it's just that's the right thing to do yes use a bit of you are you talking like intuition then as in that if that feels like the right thing to do go with it because it that feeling is there for a reason yep it's it, your eq that, that, right it's your emotional quotient yeah, stop yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. about it just do it here and if you do that and your intention is the right place all of the other nonverbal communication will come out magically right so i, I say it this way intent matters mm -hmm. more than technique does right? Your intention, because if your intentions are good, you can screw the technique up all over the place. They'll still give you another shot at it. But if they detect that your intentions are bad, in most cases, the show's over. Intention trumps technique. Wow. But and now I'm thinking of, of other stuff that I've seen, which is, yeah, this is making me think of the, the old trust equation, the, the David Meister trust equation. So it's all the good stuff with the credibility, reliability, intimacy and stuff divided by self-orientation. You do all that stuff and you can do it very deliberately and carefully, but if you're doing it with the wrong intent, yeah, which is because I will benefit from it, it don't work. It's about you, you, genuinely trying to help that other, that other person. Wow. And it, it, that will, what that will do, so, and, and there's data on this, by the way, there is, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. It'll come to me in just a second. It's uh, Lisa McLeod's the author of the book. Um, it's Selling with Noble Intent. That's the name of the book, okay? And okay. in there, she gives you the proof that you need to know. If you ever wondered, hey, does really backing off and just doing what's right for the customer, does it actually sell more? Well, it does. It's been studied. And so you don't have to sweat so hard. I would say if there's, in a word, if there's a problem, it's quota, right? Salespeople are so worried about hitting a number or, you know, paying their bills or whatever, that they stop thinking about the customer and they start thinking about themselves. And that's yeah. the moment that you've crawled into the dark side, right? But it, it, life is so much, you'll sell more and you'll enjoy the process of selling so much more if you just go in there thinking, how can I help this person? And and then and then giving 110%, being present, being genuine, Life is so much better and you'll sell more. So that's the beauty. That's the spot. That's the sweet spot, right? That we're shooting for in sales. Well, and that becomes self-fulfilling as well, doesn't it? You're having more fun. You're enjoying it. You're more relaxed. You'd be they can you're tell. therefore more approachable. They want to deal with you because of that. And, and they'll refer. Yeah. They'll refer to you after that. And you'll get to this yeah. point where you hit critical mass, where you have customers that are helping you get other customers so much so that you don't even have time for prospecting. That's a beautiful place to be, let me tell you. Yeah. Oh, it, it certainly, it certainly sounds it. It certainly sounds it. Intention then it's back to intention. So really it's now that we've got into it, it's way more than a closing question. There's a, there's a lot of stuff behind it. And then, and, you know, I know you've looked into a lot of the science as well and you've quoted some of the, some of the stuff there. Um, but you're saying 95%. So just, just remind us where that number is coming from. I think you said gong or something that, because when you're saying ask questions this way, it works, and you gave us a, you know, you did say 95%. I wrote it down. So the 90%. <laughs> Where yeah, does so that come from? Where does that come from? Because at the end of the yes. day, intention and relationships is all good, but we want the numbers. We want the numbers on this show. Sure. So what <laughs> Gong Dio? Yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> we never usually. I love the science. Make it some it's scientific. Great. I love yeah. the science of the, of the relationship stuff. It's great. <laughs> so what what Gong Dio? And you can just Google it, and you'll find the article out there where they did the study. So it's not a hard thing to find. Uh, but uh, they. Um, they did not give you the 90% metric. What they proved is that of all the different closing approaches, it was the most effective, okay? Um, so they just pr proved its superiority. What I'm giving you when I tell you 90% is I have been on hundreds and hundreds of ride-alongs where I'm watching people use 
the approach. And, and when they ask that, usually that second question, what do you think is a good next step then? In some cases, you know, maybe one out of 10, they can't come up with anything. Okay. And so, by the way, there's a lesson there. Like, imagine this, imagine I give you an ideal advance and then I give you a follow-up secondary advance or even a third one. And, and then after all that, I say, well, what do you think is a good next step then if they can't come up with anything? Well, what does that tell us about the quality of this prospect that we're looking at, right? And, and so as salespeople, the only thing we have is our time, right? That we turn time into money. And so it's really important that we spend our time working with the highest probability prospects. And so if you were literally to go through like literally three suggestions and then we ask them what the next step is and they still can't come up with anything, then you're probably in front of the wrong person. And somebody asked me this the other day. They said, hey, James, what's the single best thing um, a, a, you know, a, my company can do to improve sales. And you might think as a author of a, of a book on closing that my answer would be closing, but it isn't. Let me tell you what the answer is, what the data shows. The data shows the single most effective thing you can do to improve sales in your company or in your own personal life is to only sell to ideal clients. Okay. That's what the data shows. And the reason for that is it doesn't matter. And that's at the top of the funnel, right? Everything below there, you could be the best presenter and the best negotiator and the best everything, best offer. But if they're not, if you're selling to the wrong person, all of that falls on deaf ears. So the key, first of all, is to make sure you're in front of the right people. If you do that, I promise you, you'll absolutely get 90 to 95% effectiveness. Now, when, it, when you hear me going back and forth between 90 and 95, what I say is just the basic kindergarten model will get you to about 90% and that mm -hmm. we can get another 5% out of that if we use things like the suggestion model, the follow-up or the, the fallback, the add-on. Okay, those, those are the ways of getting a little bit more effectiveness out of it. Um, but it is not, right, people would like to say, hey, I want the thing that's going to work 100% of the time. And I, you know what, if you promise me that you're only talking to uh, qualified ideal prospects, then you probably will get about 100%, right? Because that's the real problem is, is we, that's a tough judgment to make. And a real common mistake that new salespeople make is they're so desperate to prove that they're a good hire or to get their pipeline full that they start selling to anything that moves regardless of whether it's really a good candidate or not a good candidate. And that's a classic mistake. And, then, and what I see, I'm telling you as a, as a I'm actively, um, I'm actively, you know, I'm a sales leader right now. I'm a VP of sales, right? So I manage a team is they will go after any moves and then they'll work this de deal all the way to the point where it stalls. And then they'll call me on the phone and say, Hey James, what's the magic thing that I can say to this customer that will cause this non-qualified customer to suddenly become a qualified customer and buy. And I'm like, dude, there's nothing you can say. Yeah, it, you, yeah, you're selling yeah. to the wrong person. What you want to do is make that determination at the very top and not all the way after you wasted a ton of time and figured it out at the bottom, right? And that takes a little discipline to the very beginning. And new people have a hard time identifying who's an ideal client. And that's why it's incumbent on the company or on, um, you know, on the onboarding process to teach them that so they know what to avoid. So they don't just go after anything that, you know, yeah. anything that moves. Uh, it, that's a massive area and again probably another whole podcast in itself but one of the things i i encourage people to do is not just do sort of the classic i can't say the words quantitative yeah the number quantitative of criteria yeah those ones <laughs> hard criteria yeah so money duh, 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 whatever but it's also look at the quality i can't say either of them i, yeah, I really well, got I, to change I, this stuff. I give you so two different words i like to go with the psychology look at how they think look at how they think as well and as the money and the knees yeah absolutely absolutely yeah yeah demographics and psychographics oh there we go that's my big learning point from the podcast <laughs> there you go yeah and actually there's a very easy formula that you can use to figure out your ideal clients if you haven't ever done it the first is you look at all your best customers and you look at the quantitative things you're talking about the demographics right how big are they how many employees do they have how much revenue do they do things like that are measurable right and then you need to look at the psychographic part of it like what's their attitude towards growth What's yeah. their attitude towards this or that, right? So those are those things you can figure out demographics by looking at a database somewhere. But the, the psychographics, you mostly have to have an interaction with them to figure it out. But there's there are there is ways to figure out some intention types of things before you meet them. But anyway, look at that and look for the commonalities of those things across your or your good clients, and that'll give you a template, a criteria. Say, I'm looking for people that look like this demographically, and I'm looking at people that look like this from a psychographics perspective. So when I meet someone, if they look like they're matching that, boom, that's they're qualified. That's a person I want to meet with. If they're doing good on the demographics, but they have the wrong attitude, I, I know it's tough. It's tough medicine, but you're better off going out and finding an ideal client than to continue to waste time on a non-ideal client. And that's hard medicine for salespeople to take because it's funner for them to sell in the middle of the sales funnel process, right? Yeah. Then it is for them to go prospect. It, it, I mean, for me, I don't use those words. I just say stuff like it takes two to tango. 
and, and to do the stuff and really add value and you know we're talking broadly complex sales aren't we sophisticated stuff many moving parts probably more people um we've got to be clicking with them that's what you said you know the the, the warmth the intent and then the competence but oh yeah they're perfect because they've got loads of money and they need this stuff they're a bunch of idiots and i'll never get on with them well, that'll leak out, won't it? <laughs> yeah, just even gonna, if they got a lot of money to buy stuff, to fail. You know? If they won't buy yeah. stuff, then why are you wasting time with them? Right? So, <laughs> yeah, and, and, like and, it. That's why they got loads. <laughs> yeah, and so, I, like, like your analogy, I have one where I call it throwing the ball. If I throw them the ball and then they throw the ball back to me, then I know they want to play. If I throw them the ball and they don't throw <laughs> the ball back, guys, there's no game here. We got And so that's why I advocate a little bit. A part of what an advance is is it's something that involves a commitment and it involves a little bit of energy on their part. Okay, and and, it, and those two things, and the more commitment and the more energy, the better sign that we're working with an ideal and a better customer that's going to go somewhere through the process. And so you put it's a it's a minor hurdle, but you're asking them to make a, a small step, and and that does two things: it moves you closer to closer to where you're finally you know got your big deal, you're you're closing the whole deal, but it also tells you about where the level is of their commitment to this process. And if they're not willing to to make take much commitment, then what that tells you is this is going to be a slower process for this customer, maybe even a waste of time potentially. And so those little advances are little hurdles that we're using, not just to help move the sell forward, but also to help us judge how to uh, invest our time in the different opportunities that we're working. Yeah. And as you say, that those questions go back to you know, the kindergarten version, which is what I'll use because it fits better with me. It's <laughs> um, easy. Well, <laughs> throw them the ball. It, what, what, it is timing. It's about timing. And I'm thinking about my wife, thinking about my cat, you know, <laughs> but the cat, Sometimes wants to play, sometimes doesn't. You know, sometimes you throw the ball and the cat just looks at it, goes, okay, it's ball. don't want to play with it. Sometimes yeah. it's all over the ball, jumping, 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 blah, 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 great fun. And so, you know, customers aren't like dogs, which a dog will always play with the ball, won't it? But, you know, <laughs> customers like a cat, bear with me. I, 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 yeah, you can tell I'm making this up as I go along, but it's sometimes they will want to play and they'll be all over it and they'll love it. But sometimes it's just the timing's not right. They just want to lie and sleep and just relax. Yep. But yep, another exactly time, right. yeah, they're all over it. Yeah. I mean, there is some nuance in identifying. So I, I make a distinction in the book about something called sales engagement versus an advance. And sales engagement is is um, interest without action. That's my mm -hmm. definition of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, let's just say they go on YouTube and they watch a video, or let's just say they even sit in on a webinar, but they don't do anything. That is definitely engagement. Okay. So, so there's some sales engagement happening there, but that doesn't mean it's an advance because they haven't really taken a lot of commitment or energy expended on their side to do things. And so a mistake that people make is they'll say, Hey, I had lunch with that guy. And this, I'm, I'm intentionally picking a gray area one. So people will debate me on what I'm about to share with you, but uh, lunch in and of itself is not an advance. It isn't. It's not. You might say it's strengthening your relationship or whatever. That's fine. But uh, if you do something on that launch that advances the sale, that shows some commitment and an, and an expenditure of action and energy, well, then then you've got an advance. But it, all by itself, having doing golf with somebody or having lunch with somebody is not an advance all by itself. You've got to use that venue to actually advance the sale in some way. And that's and that's a mistake that sal some salespeople make is they're assuming that just this thing that they're doing actually is progress when in reality it's not progress it's continuation right because you might meet people that will golf with you all day long because they love golf or they'll that they'll have lunch with you all day long because they like free lunch okay those things are not they're not good enough indicators but if on the other hand if at lunch they commit to introducing me to their ceo or to the other people on their team which is going to involve a commitment on their part maybe even some personal risk well, then that tells us that they're that they're engaged with us right because they're willing to do those kinds of things so that there's a little part, there's a whole part in the book where people get this wrong. And I want to make sure that they understand that the, the things you want to plan for, for your engagement is more than just strengthening the relationship. I would say that's, that is uh, table stakes. Every time you meet with a customer, you should be, your, your relationship should be getting better. Okay. It, but what's happening with the, you trying to help them move towards their goal. Is there any action or energy there? If there is right then that. And so I'm, I'm taking a, a bigger subject and trying to crunch it down in, in a short amount of time here, but yeah, no. it, that is something that people can get wrong. And they, they assume they fool themselves into believing they're making progress when in reality, most of everything that they're doing is continuations. There's a lot of well, almost fake work or sort of self <laughs> self kidding oneself going on. I say, well, there's certainly used to be, I mean, now I'd, I'd love to go out to lunch. <laughs> we've been locked down for a month and probably got another one coming but uh yeah, yeah no um look 
that is i'm just aware of time and, and you've been incredibly generous with your time incredibly generous and i've probably not left anything in the book for people to read I can't, we can't do that we want people to go out and uh, and get it you know, yeah um, the truth is most everything that we talked about they can get for free off my website if you just go to the resources tab you go to the resources tab you can download the first three chapters of the book there's like about a dozen resources there that have all the models of all the different closes they're all just there for free and that's just for you to understand how you know how it all works and if it's right for you right so I, most of that they can get for free and if you listen to a lot of the podcasts you might not even need to get the book and that's totally okay with me because part of my mission in life is not to make a ton of money on books because newsflash you, nobody makes a lot of money on books okay that's the truth <laughs> tell but, me about um, it <laughs> but what i would like to do is i would like to take the dysfunction out of selling and there's a lot of parts to that but on the closing part is where it has been over the years the most dysfunctional, where people are trying to use these manipulative techniques to try to force people into making decisions that they may not be ready for, that they may not even want. And you'll actually be more successful if you avoid all of that stuff, because all that damage is trust. And when, as soon as trust is damaged, then your chances of closing your deal are dim diminished dramatically. So I'm, I'm, that's my main goal. If you get nothing more out of this, then you never decide to try to use a manipulative tactic again, then I've made progress in the world of trying to take the dysfunction out of it. Well, I, well and I've helped a little bit by having you on and hopefully sharing it a little bit because I, I, no, I'm, I'm of the same mind. So, you know, we, we're, we're definitely on the same page, which is why well, I've absolutely loved uh, loved speaking to you and, and you sharing some of the stuff with me, which is, which is superb. Yeah, um, my pleasure. And how can people get in touch to get all this good stuff off your website? Come on, tell us what it is. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the make website, it even easier for us. Well, we you know, you because us, we, don't want, we don't want any 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 blockages here. Yeah, What's the next step? <laughs> yeah, because because Muir is a Scot <laughs> Scottish name. All of my UK friends and 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 uh, and European friends usually get my last name pronounced right. But to get it so people would pronounce it right, I I nicknamed my my website is Pure Muir because it rhymes. So it's P U R E M U I R. Dot com. And if you go there, there's a button right there that says resources. It's a whole super, I used to have like a dozen separate downloadable things. I just put it all into one big bundle. Like, like we talked about agendas on this. There's like four sample agendas you can use. So you don't have to create your own agenda. You just plug in your own stuff. There's uh, all the models. There's a mind map. I, you know, there's presentations. All that stuff is just sitting there. You just click one thing, you'll download it all and you'll have a ton of resources. It'll take you a couple of weeks to get through all the resources there that um, will help you determine if this is right for your kind of sale. And I promise it works on every kind of sale at any kind of stage, right? Even if you're in retail, it works. Your, your, your sale is just considerably simpler than someone who has, uh, you know, many, many steps in their in their more complex sale, but it still works. Brilliant. That is so generous of you, but with noble intent, which we now know is, is not a massive surprise, really, <laughs> that you, you're trying to do that. Um, so Pure Mule, that's where people can find you on LinkedIn as well, I guess you... Absolutely. There. I'm pretty yeah. prolific on LinkedIn. So that's a great place to connect with me there. Uh, I, my Twitter is B2B underscore sales tips. Uh, if you want to follow me there, that's totally fine. And then uh, you're welcome to connect with me on Facebook. If you want to see my personal stuff, it's your, your call. I'm happy to follow, follow back. Insta? <laughs> Insta. Yeah. It's, uh, it's James Pure Muir is my handle on Instagram. Brilliant. James, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get to get to talk again soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Cheers.